So tonight is uh, one of our Meet the Entrepreneurs uh, lectures. We're uh, very, very excited to have two individuals here tonight. Um, I'll first introduce Michael Atkins. Uh, brief, briefly about Michael. Uh, Michael is the president and principal shareholder in the Laurentian Media Group, uh, a diversified media company which includes a print and digital trade group, IT World Canada, uh, a consumer publisher group, CCMC Sports Group, uh, a weekly newspaper company, uh, Laurentian uh, Publishing Limited, a business publishing company, Northern Ontario Business, a web-based design collaboration business, Concept Share, uh, and a multi-purpose semantic publishing platform company. Wow, uh, a lot of stuff, digital media, uh, exceptional. Um, and most interestingly, he is actually on the board of NORCAT, so this is another person that is my boss. You've met Tom Palangelo <laughs> before, so please be nice. Uh, the second one from, uh, from Ottawa, some of you may have seen before when he was wearing his investor hat, uh, we have Lance Laking. Uh, Lance currently serves as an entrepreneur in residence uh, with the Mars Discovery District and is a director of the Investment Accelerator Fund. Uh, he has been the CEO of a number of venture-backed companies and is an advisor, angel investor in a number of technology startups. Okay, so what I would like to do to get started, gentlemen, is just to uh, maybe share a little bit about your background, where you came from. Uh, and some of the businesses that you've been part of, and then we'll get into the more detailed questions. So Lance, I'll start with you. All right, thanks Don, and uh, really happy to be here. Nice to uh, spend half my time in Toronto, so it's nice to get out of Toronto and get into some real markets rather than that Bay Street stuff all the time. So um, My background, I'm, uh, I live in Ottawa. That's my, my home. It's been my home for most of my adult life. I grew up in Saskatchewan, so I learned to play hockey in Saskatchewan and learned maybe to, how to work hard sort of around farms and that sort of thing. I went to school in southern Ontario. I went to the University of Waterloo and uh, through that process, mostly finance and business and uh, I went down a stream where I got my chartered accounting designation and sort of got into that field and recognized that that was a long path to actually uh, uh, personal wealth creation, working for someone where you're getting paid X and they're bill billing you out at Y and I didn't like that kind of gap there. So I said, mm, I think maybe I'll go and try and do something on my own. So I jumped out of that industry pretty fast and being in Ottawa, got involved into the sort of semiconductor, wireless, microwave industry and started a company there with my brother-in-law and that was a bootstrap started uh, you know, out of the garage, classic story type company. And um, we built that company up and across, you know, offices across Canada, did a reverse takeover and took that company public on the Toronto Stock Exchange and sold half of that company to a multinational based out of Switzerland. So that was a good experience to sort of get my, my feet wet. Um, from there, I went and worked for a multinational company, which again, in sort of the flight plan of, of my career, I really value the time working for larger company to see what that's like in terms of big resources and how you work inside those, uh, those bureaucracies. Uh, and from there, I jumped into a very early stage as the founding CEO of a venture-backed company in the optical networking space. Uh, and it was through that that was sort of the the height of the the height of the boom, and then the crash, and then through the dark ages of say 2000 to 2008 in the communications sector, which was tough slogging, uh, where we raised you know four or five rounds of venture funding and built that company up. So that's BTI Systems, still a, a going concern company, about 100 million in revenue to sort of put it into perspective. Since that time, I've, uh, I'm a, a partner and shareholder in an IT company in Ottawa, and I actively invest out of the Mars Investment Fund, as Don mentioned, so that's my background. Three kids, grown up, almost out of the house. One of them is still kind of <laughs> hanging around, and, um, and um, just having lots of fun. Thanks, Lance. Michael? Well, uh, we'll just talk about how I got to Sudbury. Uh, Forty years ago, most of you were not born. Some of you were, of course, but most of you were not born when I, get, when I got to Sudbury. But getting to Sudbury was, uh, uh, was interesting. Uh, I'm a refugee from Don Mills in Toronto, 
And uh, what had happened is I had gone on a motorcycle and traveled in Europe and I came back and I couldn't find work. And so a friend of mine was doing some uh, contracts for the government up in Thunder Bay and he said, come on up. So I did. I'd never heard of Thunder Bay because it had actually been called uh, Fort William and uh, uh, not Thunder Bay. Fort William, Port Arthur, of course. So uh, I arrived just after they had this name and everybody was mad, but uh, in any event. Uh, my real qualification for having my own business was that I needed to get fired more than once, and which I did very quickly. I worked for this uh, uh, government uh, operation, actually right next door. The office was right next door to the current Minister of, uh, of Northern Affairs, and he and I were in the post office. And I wrote this report about a program called Opportunities for Youth, which was a, a government program at the time, and I basically said it was a complete failure, and I explained why, and I thought it was quite brilliant. Uh, unfortunately, it got leaked into the Globe and Mail. Of course, today, everybody tries to leak stuff. I, it actually got leaked. And uh, so the Globe and Mail did a story on how this thing was failing, and at the age of 22, I was fired summarily uh, in Thunder Bay. And uh, I actually hadn't been there more than five months. I didn't know what to do. One of the people I'd interviewed was the publisher of the Fort William Times Journal. And so I went back there, and I said, geez, I'd like to have some work. I'd interviewed the publisher, and of course I went to the editor, I didn't go to the publisher, and I got a job for 50, 50 bucks a week, and uh, I fell in love. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a reporter and be in this kind of business. Uh, of course, I was really keen. Unfortunately, I got everybody worked up about doing special stories, and I got the union in the back to set stuff. And I had not counted on the fact that the editor was a fairly short guy with a short temper. And he said, this 22-year-old guy is not going to run my newsroom. And somewhat later, I got fired. Uh, <laughs> six months in, I was fired for being too keen. Literally, that's what I was fired for. But unfortunately, one of the people that worked at the Fort William Times Journal had just inherited a newspaper called the Manitoulin Expositor. Some of you may have seen it or know of it. And he said, I don't want to go to Little Current, and you don't seem to have anything to do. Why don't you go run it? So I did. Uh, I packed up my uh, motorcycle, I got in my uh, Volkswagen van, and I came down to Little Current, and I ran the Manitoulin Expositor. And uh, I loved it, again. And I loved Manitoulin Island. And uh, I was busy working away, and it occurred to me after I was in place for about three months that I'd like to go skiing uh, at Whistler. And this is the most ridiculous part of getting here to Sudbury. I thought, well, maybe uh, I'll drive. And I was dating a lovely young woman. And I set out in my uh, van to drive to Whistler. And just so the Wawa, we had a head-on collision. And I was in the Sault Ste. Marie Hospital for three months. And so I decided to, to stay at the Manitoulin Expositor. While I was running the Expositor with one leg in a cast and uh, not rocking around too much, um, uh, I had done a series of articles with a fellow by the name of Blake Dubosky. Blake became, has become a famous artist, some of you who are connoisseurs of art. And Blake was at the high school in Manitoulin Island. We did a series of stories on racism. And that kind of stuff was not ever done down there at that time. And the chairman of the Board of Education came to me and said, if you do one more story on my friend, well, I won't say the name, who is the chair, uh, your rent goes up by five, which means multiply it by five. Of course, Rick, who still owns the Expositor to this day, was back in Little Current, and he wasn't counting on me getting the rent put up by five, and so I moved the newspaper without actually telling him to another building. And I had inherited a little bit of money, and I put that money to work and bought a building and moved the paper. And uh, about a month later, I told him that he was at a new address, and. Uh, he didn't seem all that uh, worried about it. But the key thing here is that a fellow from a company called the House of Broadlam, which I don't know if it's still, it's not still here, but it, is it? Still operating, fantastic. Guy from the House of Broadlam comes down. He was a ski on of a very famous Hill family, construction family out of Hamilton. He had uh, caused them to go bankrupt, and so he had moved to Perry Sound, and he was now selling carpet. And so he came to my place, I said, son, he says, you need carpet. And uh, I said, well, 
Uh, actually, we got the paper out last week without carpet. <laughs> but he said, you know what? It would just be better. Everything would be better. So anyway, we went to the Anchor Inn across the way. We got drunk. He ended up on the floor of my cottage. And uh, he did manage to make me promise to come to Sudbury to the House of Broadlam to at least look at carpet. So I did, about two weeks later. I came to, got on my motorcycle, came to Sudbury, and I went to the House of Broadlam, and there was a guy named Ron Lewis who owned that place at the time. And he looked at me and he said, are you Atkins from Manitoulin? I must have looked odd. Well, I had a beard, I guess that was the <laughs> takeaway. I said, yes. He said, well, he said, I've got this newspaper, it's called Northern Life. I've lost a quarter of a million bucks in the last six months. My partner is not happy. He said, I'll give you a hell of a deal on the carpet if you'll take the newspaper. <laughs> All true. This is absolutely true. So I said, okay, I want purple. I bought some purple car. I don't know why I bought purple carpet. I bought purple carpet. The carpet went in. And uh, three weeks later, I came to Sudbury. And uh, I needed an accountant, and I found a guy named Ron Heal, who became a partner shortly thereafter. We did all of our planning at the, uh, oh my God, I've lost the name. What's that uh, uh, hotel downtown? Uh, Colson. Back in those days, it was just as grungy, but a lot more fun. And so we uh, did all of our planning, and one thing led to another, and I was in the newspaper business in Sudbury. And the reason I tell you that, for those of you that are looking at a business, thinking of a business, uh, being nervous about a business, uh, things are never in a straight line. And it's always, you go with your gut. It was, it was absurd to go through the process I went through, but I was on a journey. And uh, I have no regrets with lots of ups and downs. And uh, I'll just, to wrap, I'll just show you one quick thing that I picked up today. This was, uh, this was our first front page 40 years ago. It was exactly 40 years ago in September. God, it looks awful. <laughs> but I wrote that editorial, and I can say that 40 years later, we pretty much lived up to what we said. So it's great to be here in Sudbury. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just family, uh, children, Michael? I got all sorts of them. I got two stepkids. <laughs> I go from 44 to 16. I got, uh, my stepkids live in Vancouver. Uh, my other daughter, who is 42, lives uh, near Nelson, BC. And my 16-year-old is a downhill competitive skier who has now uh, uh, disembarked for the National Ski Academy in Collingwood and we get to see her on weekends when she isn't competing in Quebec and everywhere else. Wow. Okay. Well, I know there's something you guys can talk about afterward. I know Lance is a big skier. Um, so I want to build on your, 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 uh, your comment, uh, Michael, about it. You know, entrepreneurship is, is not a straight line at all. And maybe, Lance, I'll turn it back over to you to maybe share some insights with the group around you know, in doing what you were doing as a founding CEO and, and, and starting early stage companies, what were some of the really unexpected things that happened, either personally or professionally, uh, in your experiences? Oh, unexpected. I think, I mean, to your point, the unexpected is almost the, the norm, and you get, you get used to uh, uh, all that flight plan that you expect is not the flight plan that, that actually transpires. Um, for, for me, I guess some of the unexpected things are those, those uh, curveballs that come from outside that aren't controllable. And you have best ambitions about customers and revenues and orders, and there's always, uh, there's always um, surprises around that, I would say. So unexpected things like making payroll, I think that that has to be expected rather than being unexpected, but um, the, I, th I think one of the things that I, um, I was most surprised about was the fact that, that uh, everything takes longer and you have to, you have to um, celebrate the, the little wins rather than, I'm, I'm sort of 
aggressively always looking for the big end game. And um, I think celebrating the, the little wins was some of the things I learned to you know, gather more around, around the process. Michael? I'd say there were, there, there were some really unexpected results. One is that I always compete. Didn't quite realize it at the time because I was just moving fast from the carpet. But uh, we compete with billion dollar companies. And I had no idea how uh, much they took exception to me being in business. Uh, the, the Subway Star, which has been owned by Conrad Black and by Thompson Newspapers and by I, it's got Sun Media now, they're uh, incredibly competitive in terms of pricing and trying to run you out of business. Less competitive in terms of creativity, which is why we're able to survive. So that surprised me. And the other thing, which would be true for any media person today, is that you go from competition to disruption. And what we're dealing with in every one of our companies, and one of the reasons that I have a number of digital companies today, is that uh, I got introduced to it pretty quickly as to what can happen. We're not quite as dramatically affected here in Sudbury because uh, there's still a push technology called flyers. When you go to the, when you go to the internet, uh, people know what they want. So I'm going for uh, you know, tires this week and I just want the best deal. So the Canadian Tire Flyer still has life because they actually want you to be thinking about more than tires. So oddly enough, that uh, keeps us in survival mode here. But in my technology company, IT World Canada, we have no more print at all. Uh, in fact, we're not a publisher because Every one of you today is a publisher. You'll pay me more money to help you be a publisher than you will pay me to be a publisher. So we have gone through an excruciating, dramatic, total change in what our business is in the last five years. It's half the size in terms of people. In terms of people. Uh, it's likely gonna be more profitable when we get through all of this incredibly difficult time. But disruptive technologies, that's where you live, that's where you're gonna be, that's what you have to think about, and that's what I've had to think about that I surely was not thinking about 40 years ago or 10. So if I, if I build on that point, if you look back over the last 40 years, and you were to take one or two of the real down times, you know, things were not going well at all, potentially the multiple firings, which I didn't know about, but moving on from that, but if you take a couple of really down times, how did you stay inspired and motivated to say, I'm gonna to continue to push through, take on debt to, with a newspaper to build it and grow it versus I'm just gonna go get a day job at a bank. How did you stay inspired to kind of push through with that? Well, uh, you know, I think it's your personality. I mean, I, I really enjoy it. We're involved in extraordinarily positive things uh, because we're really in the community development business. Uh, so we align ourselves with community wherever we go. We have the Community Builders Awards, best night of the year for me, because we're, we're excited about seeing other people be successful. In my business, the most, the most energy I get is when I help someone else empower someone else to be successful. So I've been lucky to the extent that what I do inspires me every day of the week. But you have to you have to remember what inspires you because I've fallen off the track. I just wrote a column about this, oddly. I still write a column. I don't tweet. I'm not on Facebook. Once a month, I write a column. But I just wrote about this, and it's about why. Why do you do what you do? And a couple of times, I've forgotten. One of them, I grew my company, my newspaper group. I'm in a variety of different businesses, as I said. But I grew my newspaper group from five to 30. I was the largest weekly newspaper publisher in Ontario for a brief time. Because what inspired me was not growth, but I got excited about it. I borrowed a lot of money. I, got, I was given a lot of money because I was the flavor of the month for about a month, 20 years ago. <laughs> and I ran flat into a recession, and it took me 10 years to deal with the debt that I had accumulated. But I've had more fun, more fun reinventing Northern life uh, with my great partners in this uh, city in the last 10 years than I ever had having 30 newspapers from uh, Toronto to Sarnia. 
So Lance, you know, if I ask you a comparable question to kind of look back over the last, you know, 30 some odd years, you know, find a couple of downtimes, you know, how did you stay inspired to say, I'm going to continue to pursue this entrepreneurial, potentially somewhat independent lifestyle? Yeah, some of it's just dogged determination and perseverance. I, I would say a big part of it for me is when you're an employer and you have, you know, 12 or 50 or 250 staff, uh, I have a strong internal motivation to, to continue to succeed and, and because there's a lot of people counting on the success of the business and there's a lot of families behind it and I took a lot of, a lot of uh, motivation and inspiration from that. I think for myself personally, the inspiration that I drew from was strong, effective, board uh, uh, involvement where I would surround myself with folks that have great experience and help to pick you up when, when the days are, are long and hard and, and also tried to have sort of outside of the, the, gov the governance model around businesses just to have a mentor or three that you could sort of uh, let your hair down so to speak and talk through some of the, the problems and that that for me was a real key element to remaining inspired. So one of the, one of the themes we've talked about a fair bit in this class is uh, capital, be it individuals maxing out their credit cards to get started, individuals getting lines of credit, thinking about equity investment. Um, can you speak to, and Lance, I'll start with you, as you're building your business, what did you find more challenging? raising and getting capital, be it getting more credit cards and debt or raising equity, or finding the right people to join you to actually grow your entrepreneurial endeavor? Yeah. It's kind of the capital versus talent question. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> I hate to use the word depends. Uh, I guess it, it relates, though, somewhat to where your, where your comfort zone is or where your, your real area of, of strength is. Believe me, raising venture capital in the mid-2000s into an optical networking company was no short uh, you know, task. It was very, very challenging. However, that's kind of where I'm wired and that's where I have sort of strong area of expertise. And so as hard as it was, I was pretty good at it and so that wasn't wasn't as, as tough. I think the, the talent side of it relates also to the fact that you're always trying to punch way above your weight. And, and so you're trying to pull in top talent into a company that is thinly capitalized, that you know, isn't the most stable place to work, and that you're competing against these big established companies that have benefit plans and all these <laughs> things. And, and yet you have to, you know, try and compete with the old, you know, challenge and work experience and build something that means something and so on and so forth. So I think the talent strategy for young companies is, is harder, you know, from, from my experience. Michael? Well, yeah, it depends. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's not like your own personal experience with uh, credit. On the way up, uh, they cannot give you enough money, i.e. 30 newspapers. Um, so if you're successful, you can have all sorts of money and then you can do all the things you didn't start out to do and then you have to figure out why am I doing it. So money is very tough to get. Um, um, but I find people are easier to get uh, in, in my line of work and the reason is that if you can explain to your partners and explain to the people that you want to attract why you're doing what you're doing, what your values are, who you are, what the objective is, how you're going to be treated, stay to that. All sorts of people are just thrilled to have the opportunity to be treated with respect, to have an opportunity to do something that is different or new or because, you know, life in Canada is pretty boring by and large. It's, you know, I mean, let's face it, uh, there's not as much energy in some of our sectors, as I'd like to say, and there are all sorts, we have to remember, we have the freedom to be successful or to fail. 
And for a certain kind of person, that is the juice. I mean, for me, um, I get off track sometimes on the why, but I always love the competition. I love it. I enjoy it. I like to to see how we can do and what we can do that's different and better and smarter and more exciting. And so uh, people ultimately, if you're prepared to give some equity, be fair, you can find them. The money is a tougher deal. And um, I don't know that there's ever a solution to it except to turn to the people you know who believe in you to get going. So one of the, one of the other things we talk about here is most successful entrepreneurs never go it alone. Uh, they always have help and support. So if I ask the question, you know, if you look back, you know, who or what would you have recognized now or maybe even at the time was a key support to help you do what you do, maybe something pivotal? And then maybe you can share some insight as to what you might recommend this group in terms of, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. So I'll start with maybe something in your career either a who or a what that was pivotal to help you to get to where you were, and then maybe share some insight for this group of things to consider as you're embarking on that path to start your organization or your business. Um, so <clears throat> I, I did uh, benefit from having business partners in the first two businesses that I was involved with, and I think where I drew a lot of uh, sort of pivotal sort of benefit was the the yin and yang sort of thing, where uh, my business partner was uh, sort of balls to the wall, so to speak. There is no downside. We can go full out and risk everything. And I, on the other side, as, as friendly and, and uh, warm as I am to taking risk, I was looking like the very, very risk adverse banker guy. And so uh, I think having diversity sort of in the management team of a business you want to create and having a nice cross balance such that you're not all drinking the same Kool-Aid and you're not being you know, fooled by a false sort of sense of, uh, of comfort is a really, a really positive thing that you should, be, you should be open and honest not only with your business partners but with all the staff on the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's that, uh, that, that, that sort of um, feedback and, and calling you out when maybe there is disagreement amongst you know, a, a next step or a plan is, was really key for me. And, and, and maybe I'll, I'll go to Michael, but Lance, maybe I could ask you to be you know, even more specific as you, as you think through this, if there was one person or one moment that you might be able to reflect upon. But I'll let you think. Yeah. But you know, Michael, if I, if I turn it to you, you know, the same question. You know, were there, you know, who or what might have been a key support for you, uh, again, at a pivotal moment to kind of, that you can look back and say, you know, that type of support was critical in helping me get to where I am today? Back to the Colson Hotel. <laughs> um, I uh, happened on, and the advice is, don't ever be afraid to ask anybody anything at any time. Because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to keep asking questions. You've got to bring everybody in. When I came to town, I didn't know a soul. I'd been in Manitoulin in a cast for, you know, a year. <laughs> uh, but one guy knew another guy knew another guy. And uh, I had an extraordinary group of three additional investors who taught me what I needed to know. Uh, and so what had happened is that we all went to the Colson to talk about this and they said, this is absurd. And I just made a speech, back then it made sense, uh, that this town needed another newspaper. It was run by Jim Meeks and that's ridiculous and it's absurd and have you got any guts or not, you guys? And they bought in. And they were extraordinary. Uh, the partnership, for a whole bunch of other reasons, uh, wound up about eight or nine years later. I think I'm, I'm, uh, I never went back to having a board, been running my own show. I've drawn the strength out of the partnerships I have because what I do is I invest in people. They earn equity as they, uh, as they drive the business. And so the energy and the sharing has been at the 
uh, colleague level, not so much the mentorship level, you know, after that first uh, eight or nine years, I could not have possibly made it without their help. And so that leads to the, the uh, need for an ecosystem. And, and often it is uh, an accountant and a lawyer, a banker or an investor, someone like yourself, someone who has experience, but someone who has passion. Not, you gotta find people that have a personality and have an interest in, in what you're doing. They gotta believe in it, they gotta believe in you. And if you can get that ecosystem, whether they're mentors or investors or just fellow travelers, you need that, because it's lonely. It's very, very lonely trying to figure it out if you don't have those people to talk to. Lance, after being pensive for about three minutes, Ugh. is there one person or one specific moment that you would say you helped know, you out? It, it's tough to pin one person up, but you know, I would say, you know, it, it sounds a bit like a, a standard canned at answer, but my my wife and bedroom consulting, as it's as it's known, sort <laughs> of has been has been a savior for me because. Uh, it's funny where sometimes the people that are so disconnected from, say, a very technology-oriented sort of career and business and everything is quite, you know, it's, it's a complex playing field that I've been used to. And, and my wife is uh, a social purpose uh, driven, um, you know, person, either a homemaker or working in a church or something like, like that. And she's just always that that uh, counterbalancing voice of reason that kind of pulled me back and said, no, no, you, you have to think about this. And I said, well, why would that even matter? So I, I would have to point her up as, as the number one. There, there have been others like, you know, that, that venture capital investor that took the chance when I had knocked on 48 doors across Sand Hill Road and up and down Palo Alto times three. And then you find that one person that takes a chance, you know, and, and says yes, despite all the ones that have said no. You know, so you'd have to say that, wow, that, that, that was it. And, you know, that's, you know that's, that's one of the key points. And the other one, like you mentioned, is a, a, a lawyer that I've done business with for 30 years that I, I still would rely on. Having those, that type of an advisor network is super valuable. So kind of, uh, and just for the audience sake, uh, I only have two more questions, so if you're thinking them, get them ready to go, and then we'll jump out in a moment. Um, is there anything that you would have, looking back, knowing what you know now that you would have done differently? Um, and maybe Lance, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you to, to kind of continue on. Is there any, uh, any, anything you would have changed in terms of the path to get to where you are today, or anything along those lines? I definitely would have, um spent more time thinking about exit. And um, not that you shouldn't build businesses all about exit, but you should, I think, always think about what is the exit. Because there's a big risk that you get involved and you get in the grind and you work and you work and you work and you don't step back enough and say, what? What is my end game or what are the end game options? That classic plan B, C, D sort of thing. But I, that, I would definitely have spent more time focusing on exit. Because we had, for example, at BTI, we had the opportunity to go out twice. And, and um, in one case, I had a more greedy board than I was, and the greedy board said, no, we're going to hold for a higher value opportunity downstream, mistake. Uh, or in, in another case, it was one where we had the opportunity and we didn't, we didn't work hard enough at that, at that partnership and closing the deal, so to speak. So that, that would be my, my my re not so much regret, but my lesson learned is spend a lot more time thinking about uh, about the the exit. Michael, uh, no. Uh, if you go back and look at various decisions that I would have made, you say, well, geez, I, you know, that was kind of stupid. Uh, 
like the, what I mentioned when I went to 30 newspapers. Uh, and what happened, I'll tell you what happened, is that the people I borrowed money from went broke. I didn't, but they did. And the bank behind them caused me all the trouble. But the reality is that I had to go through that to learn uh, about my why. I had to remember that, you see, and, and I'll just tell you this because it's really important. Um, why I'm in the newspaper business is to develop community. That's what I like. I love it. It's very important to me. But when I had 30 newspapers, I was thinking about, well, you know, if the advertising percentage was just 5% different, that's another $286,000. That's not why I got in the business. I didn't get in the business for growth. I got in it for, for community development. So, no, I don't think I'd change anything. I would change all sorts of decisions. But that doesn't mean you'd want to replay it because you couldn't learn what you got to learn. So this, uh, this will be my last question. Um, everyone in this room tonight is either thinking about starting a business or have already started but are, at, but are at the early stages. Kind of the cliche question, but if you could give them one core piece of advice as they embark on it, you know, the personal implications, financial, professional, career, they're all at different stages in their life, all at different stages in their business. What's one parting message you would just want them to walk out of here remembering? And Michael, I'll start with you. Uh, do the homework. Um, you've got to know what your product is, if it's a product. You've got to know what your service is, if it's a service. You've got to know your budget. You've got to know what happens with 10 scenarios. You've got to know who's going to do the work. You gotta know how much money you got. You gotta do the homework, every piece of homework that you can possibly think of. With the ECHO team around you, you've gotta get that advice so that you've got a chance. I didn't do my homework, and I got lucky. When I, you know, when I arrived with the newspaper and the carpet, like, but I had very little to lose. So everything's at a different stage. So once you do the homework, don't be afraid to go. But don't take the risk of uh, destroying your personal life. If you've got children to look after, you've got things to do, uh, be smart. Quantify, quantify what you're prepared to. It's no different than going to the casino. How much am I prepared to lose? Who's going to play? And what's the homework? D don't ever do it without the homework. Don't, do it, don't fall in love with it. I did. And I got lucky. But it took me a long time to get lucky, let me tell you. Lance, one thing you want the would-be or nascent entrepreneurs to walk out of here remembering? Oh, man. One thing. Uh, I mean, yes, yes, being prepared and having the homework in place uh, is, is core to it. I, I think having, having um, you know, your personal life prepared around it, be it your spouse or your friends and family, aware of the fact that you're going to go down a much different path than a nine to five job. And it is much different and it's grueling and you will uh, sacrifice a lot of things. That you have to, you have to sign up for that if, and, and be, be prepared for it. Um, and, and I think the, the other point is it's, it's sort of the um, Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion, you know, double it and add 30 on all the things that you think are going to happen. And, and so if you think you need $100,000 to get this done, it's actually $230,000. So, so you really have to um, be, be prepared for, um, for uh, a, a much, a much more, uh, a much different sort of an aggressive sort of mountain to climb than than it looks like on on, on the business plan you've drafted up. I'll tell you that um, people are attracted to your values. Okay, we have all sorts of people that work for us who could do better elsewhere from a strictly financial point of view sometimes. Uh, it's an adventure. Uh, but, but business for me, uh, this is not always the case, but business for me is much, uh, is really 
committed to some of the broader pictures. In our case, it's community development. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, being true to yourself. It's, it's uh, treating people with respect. So people come. People knock on the door for that. Um, sure, a lot of people, I'm doing this to make money, and it's a great business plan, or, you know. But the kind of talent you really want, they come to values. And we've been very lucky. And it's not me that brought those fabulous people in. It's my partners. Um, Patricia and Abbas uh, are extraordinary people. We're completely in sync with our values. And we have different skills um, and different talents. But when we sit down and look at an important issue, we're never in disagreement. Uh, so that's what it is. And I'm very proud of that. And it's been nip and tuck many times in terms of uh, competing against people that have more money. But at the end of the day, we have been both, I think, skilled and lucky to be where we are today, which is the last independent suburban newspaper in the country. I've, I've, I've occasionally allowed my uh, enthusiasm for an idea run ahead of the s smartness of the business, and I've had to go fix it or get out of it. Um, I've made some mistakes with people, and that's very painful because when you discuss, I mean, I've been involved in 50 or 60 businesses over my career, so they're always investing in people, not in the business, not in the product, and not in the service. I've always invested in the people. And from time to time, I have made mistakes, which I like to have back, because it's destroyed a perfectly good idea, <laughs> or it's hurt people who had to be laid off because that person was not who I thought they were. So there are lessons learned, but they're quite specific to my business or where I live in, a, in, a, in the circle of, of my business. So there are decisions that I've made that I'd like to have back because I lost a million bucks. And I'd rather not have done it, but mostly I would rather not have brought a whole bunch of people down a path and they believed in me and they believed in that person and then you have to say, you know what? We're done, it's over. Probably what I had to learn is when to say it's over, because I have spent a lot of money staying on a horse from time to time I should not have stayed on because I'm stubborn <laughs> and because the people that were working on it were so passionate. So I've made those mistakes, but I don't know if I want them back. I don't know. They were just mistakes. And the one thing that I've said time and time again if you have not failed lately, you are not trying hard enough. I think from my side, um, you're never, ever, ever, ever going to be able to do all the things as good as your big, bad competitors will do. You don't have a chance to come out of the starting blocks and do all the things that they can do. And so I think having, uh, picking one thing that you do unbelievably well and better and different than those Goliaths is, is critical. And you know, that might be, I mean, in, our, in my first company, we attracted some of the best people because we had the best Christmas party in the industry, <laughs> like, bar, bar none. It was, it was crazy good. Uh, and so, it fun, it's, you know, it's a thing, but that actually was, was something that we got known for. But on a product side, and in a, say a technology company, it's, um, it's playing that fine balance of minimum viable product, but having one aspect in that product that is absolutely compelling, solving that you know, bleeding neck wound without killing yourself on trying to make something perfect and, and waiting, 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 because those opportunities, man, they close. Those windows close fast and you only have, you know, your new shiny new idea is probably only going to be new and shiny for six or 12 or 18 months maximum. I don't care how many patents you have. So that's... Okay. 
Well, yeah, my, my experience is not, I don't advertise this as necessarily applicable in the digital age. It's kind of a different game, and I'm, I'm now investing in digital companies, and I've won and I've, and I've lost. In terms of business case uh, versus gut, I've probably made many more gut decisions because my decisions, remember, as an investor and, a, and as a, someone who expanded my uh, media business, uh, I was making bets on people far more than I was making bets on that particular business. And I have been wildly successful, quite surprisingly on occasion, and of course the opposite. So I don't know that that's a regular thing or that I, I could recommend that in the digital world where uh, the precise knowledge of the arc of a particular technology, the competitive aspects, how long you've got any chance to be uh, in front of the parade, that gets far more technical. I don't even know if it's a business case thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's particular to to the tech side of it, because these windows open and close, as Lance was saying, very, very quickly. Uh, but still, even in my digital world, it's people that I've been betting on, but it's not, I don't think it's the norm, but Lance, you make these investments. I don't know whether you're investing uh, in product or people. I think you have to have rigor around your decision process, but at the same time, as a young startup company, one of your key advantages is your ability to move fast and to, and to be able to pivot fast or make quick decisions. And so if you're waiting for, I don't know, 100% of the information, you are going to die. And so, so I think that somewhere in and around uh, maybe 60, maximum 70% of kind of fast blush of pull in the information, then you, you take that gut feel, but you have to decide fast. It's, you know, you have to fire fast, and you maybe hire slow, but you have to decide fast. I, I'd call it a, a disease, a documented disease that's called founderitis. And, and uh, the, the risk there is that, that um, all the goodness that you've brought to create the beast and, and grow it up and drive initial success, uh, the ability to step back and have the, the humble uh, slash common sense to say that I am now moving outside of my area of comfort and expertise and it's time to pass the baton or I'm going to continue to hire people that are smarter than me and rely on, uh, rely on their abilities to, to help, I think is, is part of it for sure. Um, so there's no magical time or, or answer to when you might do it or not. I think it again comes down to, you know, if, if you've got those, those things churning in your stomach saying, man, I just don't know a lot about this. It might be time that you move over to where, where you are good. You know? In my case, uh, I had these fabulous people that had invested in me. And so I worked seven days a week, round the clock, uh, for five years uh, as a managing editor, as a circulation manager, as a production guy, as the everything in terms of the newspaper business. And when I got to the point where we had actually uh, uh, created a business that had some profit. I had to think, what do I want to do? And what am I good at? You're really good, got to be able to do that. And I realized I was a better leader than a manager. So when I was 30 years old, I started the business when I was 25. When I was 30, I decided to step back from managing, editing, still write the column, and I don't have my editor edit it. But apart <laughs> from that, apart from that one thing that I'm allowed to do because I own the company, um, all of my investments have been in people that operate and as the investor my job is values, strategy, banking, fires and new stuff. And I stay out of the operations. Except, you know, if somebody quits and disappears and I gotta go in and run it for a while to clean it up or whatever. But I stay out of the operating because that's where I belong, out of the operating.